If you have played any part of the Stalker series and wished that it had an online component so that you could experience that world with other humans at the same time, then Will to Live Online is your wish come true. You could say it's a hardcore FPS MMORPG that, much like its inspiration, is dripping with atmosphere thanks to its world design, both artistically and due to its unforgiving interactions with the player. It's very unique among its modern peers in that it offers an uncompromisingly difficult and somewhat vague experience from the get-go. Whether this is a good thing or not is up to you, of course, but I view this as a positive, as it doesn't intentionally go out of the way to obfuscate its mechanics and features, but rather holds a trust in the player's own curiosity and basic intelligence to get them on the right track, which isn't really a difficult task at all, considering how small the current starting area is. As I said before, the game is dripping with atmosphere, and while the aforementioned world and art design serve as a solid foundation, it is further bolstered by the game's mechanics and features that a player must always be in consideration of. Being a first-person shooter, the vast majority of combat is done with guns, and each gun uses a different calibre ammunition, each with their own types according to the calibre. Hollow point, full metal jacket, armor piercing, each with their own differing amounts of flesh damage and armor piercing capabilities that must be bought, carried, and considered by the player according to which enemies they plan to be fighting. There is a maximum carry weight which differs depending on your chosen class, and everything you pick up has a weight to consider, including ammunition, quest items, and even the clothes you wear. This weight dynamically affects your stamina, which drains faster the heavier you are, eventually preventing the ability to run if you get too heavy, causing the player to have to carefully balance and optimize the loot they have according to its weight versus value. But before you crinkle your face and frown at this limitation, the game does provide a solution to this. Should you decide that there is absolutely nothing you can destroy and want to keep it all, then you have the ability to place a personal stash bag anywhere in the world and transfer items to this, freeing up your weight so you may deliver what you have on your person and return back to the stash later to collect. But this comes with a risk. Other players may interact with and loot your stash if they find it, so you had better place it in a well-hidden location, or make sure that another player is not watching as you do so. It adds a very interesting and oftentimes tense feeling of risk in exchange for your wanting to be greedy, or if you're anticipating a likely death and don't want to chance losing a particular item. That's right, upon death you drop a random amount of your items at the location you died, which again can be looted by other players if you don't get back to it in time or you die again on the way. For many quests, you often aren't given an exact marker to go to, but instead given an area name or grid location which you must find on your map, and then search that general zone, meaning the player needs to pay attention and rely on their eyes and ears upon arriving at their destination. The wastelands are vast, with lots of empty space between various landmarks of interest, a player may also place a custom marker anywhere on the map, which they may name, should they find anything noteworthy, such as an area rich with firewood to be collected for making campfires, or a place you find that is good for obtaining particular items of use. Campfires can be made in most places within the world, as well as being useful for cooking the various kinds of meat you can obtain from your kills to help restore your stamina, they also act as a very slow health regeneration point and a temporary respawn point so long as you keep the fire burning. And to keep it burning for longer, you'll need to add more fuel, such as more firewood or coal. There is a hunger and thirst system, both of which deplete at a fair pace, and obtaining food or drink is not usually a problem as it is fairly plentiful. You may only find yourself in trouble if you go on an unusually large expedition and fail to bring adequate supplies, or get killed and lose some. There is also a crafting system, allowing one to craft various items of use, or just to be sold on the market for a profit. Nighttime in Will to Live Online is fantastic, 
often going near pitch black depending on the weather, meaning you may only rely on your torch to see, and it completely changes how you approach a task, sometimes it being better to avoid doing a particular task at night due to how much more dangerous the low visibility can make it. The various caves and bunkers to be found, usually full of deadly monsters, can be genuinely frightening due to the pitch-black darkness and eerie atmosphere, punctuated by some reasonably good sound design. Death comes quickly in this game, and if you approach a fight carelessly or without preparation, then even the most basic of mutated rat or dog will make quick work of you. There are also various anomalies and areas of high radiation to be found in the wasteland, features ripped straight from Stalker, a lot of them being deadly upon contact for the ill-prepared, and often hard to detect if you're not listening to the subtle sounds they make. Other players may also become a threat, which adds extra tension to exploring if you hear gunfire near you or in a location you need to be for a quest. Do you risk going there and hoping they don't attack you? Or do you attack them first, just in case? Or just watch and wait from a distance until they go away? Or perhaps try to work together with them? All of these concerns play beautifully into the overall dangerous and oppressive atmosphere the game has. And it's worth noting that world PvP can be toggled off during your character's first 15 levels in exchange for a small experience penalty. I'm oddly reminded a little of vanilla World of Warcraft when getting into a proper play session of Will to Live. A comparison you may understandably find hard to draw from the outset, but for me the experience of playing can become somewhat hypnotic after a while, with an undertone of catharsis. Once finding my feet within the world and establishing a confident rhythm, I found it difficult to pull myself away as I travelled, ever curious of what awaited me over the next hill or in the next zone, feeling compelled to explore the possibilities regardless of the risk, much like World of Warcraft was for me a long time ago. So after describing all of this, and if you're the target audience, you're likely chomping at the bit and eager to jump in. But you also might be wondering why I say this game has potential, rather than just exclaiming it to be a great game which you should go and play. Well, all of these things, as excellent as they are, come with a few large caveats. The first being that the game is in early access, currently as an alpha build, and has been so for over a year now. To its credit though, it's the most stable alpha slash early access build I've ever played. It's already very well optimized running on Unreal Engine 4, the game servers seem stable and offer good pings, and the bugs I've encountered have been minor or negligible that have never affected my ability to play the game, and they have a very simple, quick, and intuitive means of sending bug reports or suggestions while in-game. They have done an excellent job thus far putting other, more well-funded or even finished games to shame in terms of stability. The second caveat being that there are very few players populating the servers currently, with exception of a single server in Russia which is usually moderately full, most of the other regions remain barren. During peak playtimes, it is rare to see or hear another player in the major town, and even rarer to find one out in the wasteland. During non-peak times, you'll very rarely or never find another player during your entire play session. This is a big problem, because a lot of the game experience and world design seems to play off of the potential interactions between players, both hostile and cooperative, and without that element in play, the world becomes a far less interesting place to occupy. Even the developers said themselves that Will to Live Online is mainly about the faction wars that occurs between players in the late game. So why are there so few players then? Well, I can only speculate from my perspective, but attempting to answer this question leads me to the third and final caveat, or caveats. Still being an alpha build and not feature complete, there are many aspects of the game which are poorly or not yet implemented. These placeholder missing or underdeveloped features severely compromise the atmosphere that the game tries very hard to build. 
shattering the immersion and producing quite a monotonous and tedious gameplay loop with little else to do, particularly at the lower levels, which is very much likely why the players have been driven away. The monsters you fight are likely the first major factor that pushes players away from returning. With very few exceptions, they all behave exactly the same, and so the player's interaction with them is always the same too. No matter which creature it is, you aggro them, they charge at you mindlessly in a straight line with static, stiff, boring animations, and when they reach you, they stand and do the exact same single attack animation over and over again, which don't really feel like they connect with your character at all. Your attacks against them also play out in the same manner. The enemies do not react in any way to your attacks hitting them, and just all charge and attack until either they or you die. Through these attacks, the monsters may sometimes poison or cause you to bleed, but some of them might spit at you on the way, and some attacks cripple your movement speed briefly, but you may not do anything else to them other than direct damage. It results in all combat encounters playing out exactly the same way, no matter the weapon or enemy. It's essentially always a DPS race, and can become stale very quickly if combat is your primary interest in the game. The combat in its current state is devoid of any feeling or dynamic behaviour. I find this aspect personally to be a great letdown, as upon first stepping into the world with its thick and developed atmosphere, you would expect tense, nerve-wracking combat to be an obvious accompaniment to this. One might argue that the simple enemy behaviour is akin to many other MMOs in which they just do basic auto-attacks, and so it's unfair to criticise Will to Live Online for also having this. To which I'd counter and say that Will to Live Online presents itself in a completely unique manner to its competition due to the first-person shooter approach. With that presentation and the way the player interacts with the world like they would a fully-fledged FPS, there are expectations that come from this. The typical static auto-attack of enemies, contrasted with the dynamic freedom of movement and attacking from the player, just do not work together at all. Pulling you further out of the experience are some of the sounds, which have remained as placeholders for a long time now. Most notable is the gunfire, which uses the exact same single generic gunshot sound that has only been slightly altered in pitch per weapon, making each gun feel exactly the same. For a game that clearly has had so much effort put into its atmosphere and immersive qualities, I can't believe they have left the gunfire sound like this for as long as they have. In the early game, players spend a lot of time with a single weapon until they level up enough and can afford something new, which they subsequently then spend a lot of time with. So it is vital that the weapons feel distinct from one another and the player feel connected to them. The sound of each one is a huge part of achieving this. It should be obvious by this stage of gaming's life cycle. So combine weapons that feel and sound exactly the same except for fire rate, with combat encounters that feel exactly the same because of enemy behaviour, and then consider that this is how the player will interact with the world for the majority of their time playing, then you have a potentially catastrophic play cycle that leaves the average player feeling very bored as this cycle completely undermines the rest of the atmosphere the game tries to build. This is bitterly punctuated more so by the fact the weapons are very well crafted and feature some meticulous detail such as the reload animations and are also supposed to have complex ballistics. Other sounds also suffer within the game and serve to take you out of the experience, such as monster footsteps and the general noises they make being very limited and monotonous. There is also a sound issue that prevents you hearing any noise a monster makes when they are directly behind the player, leading to some irritating sneak attacks. 
Player footstep sounds are also very limited in variation, nor do they sound very convincing. A minor issue to be sure, but again, all still serving to take the player out of the world, which is the key point. There are currently four different classes to choose from. The Miner, Mercenary, Engineer and Hunter. All of which claim to be quite distinct from one another in their descriptions, but in reality, during the earlier levels at least, they all play exactly the same way. Each has a proficiency with a particular weapon class, and there are certain weapons later which can only be used exclusively by their respective class. But for the first several hours of gameplay at least, a player will be using the exact same couple of weapons, and play the game in exactly the same way, irrespective of their class choice. There are stats and skills to invest in later, but they remain hugely underdeveloped, lack any meaningful choices, and the differences they offer between classes are mostly negligible, with the only exception being the class of armor they're allowed to wear, which can make a big difference in survivability later on. The quests are also standard affairs one would expect from an MMO, most being variations of go to place and kill, or go to place and collect. A lot of them require a player to travel large distances across the wasteland, which must be done by foot. I've no problem with this personally, but I've read complaints of the wasteland being too empty and boring, so this may also push players away. I can understand this perspective, but I disagree with it being too empty. It is, after all, a post-apocalyptic wasteland that has been previously ravaged by nuclear weapons. If it were bustling with life, then that would spoil the intended atmosphere. I think the main issue that causes this line of thinking from players is the unforgiving difficulty of the game, which can dissuade you from exploring areas lest you run into significantly higher level monsters that aggro on you from very far away, chase you endlessly, and eventually one-shot you. Not to mention the various anomalies that will also one-shot you in the early levels. This leads to a player feeling restricted to the same few safe areas and paths for a long time, or at least I did with nothing new to see for hours, and thus this opinion forms. In reality, there are many areas of interest scattered around, some marked and some not, and plenty of resource-rich areas for gathering purposes. With the correct mindset, you will find yourself placing custom markers often in your travels. That being said, adding a few more ruins, perhaps adding some more non-hostile critters, and increasing the frequency of more winnable enemy encounters a little more early in the game certainly wouldn't hurt to stave away this initial impression. The caveats I focused on have mainly been those which severely hamper Will to Live's greatest strength, its atmospheric and immersive qualities. There has clearly been much effort placed into the development of this game, and the developers themselves appear to be talented at their craft, and have a reasonably clear vision of the game they wish to make. And I believe that if they focus on fixing the issues that break the atmosphere, the combat especially, then a player will find it easy to gladly sink their teeth into the world and immerse themselves enough to be engrossed with what is currently on offer while the developers work on adding more features and systems and build upon the existing ones. Let's have more enemies which display unique behaviours and reactions according to their creature type. Let's have enemies that react to your attacking them, and being stunned or crippled or afflicted with a status depending on where you hit and what bullet calibre you're using. Let's have them make different noises according to their status and move in more than a single direction when in combat. And let's give them more dynamic and interesting movement animations. Let's have proper gunshot sounds so we may appropriately feel the power of our weapons. Let's have a more diverse range of unique movement sounds from enemies and players so we can hear the slow crunch of grass as we stalk our prey through the fields and perhaps be good enough to give us an idea of what could be stalking us in the pitch-black darkness. Let's have properly distinct classes with talents and abilities that are meaningful and interesting, giving each one an appropriate edge in the situations they are supposed to be suited for. 
In spite of these rather detrimental flaws holding the experience back for all but the most insistent of players, Will to Live Online has huge potential within the MMO market as it fills a niche that no others do and manages to effortlessly marry a hardcore survival genre into a very functioning MMO title while still retaining the soul of its inspiration. These developers clearly care about their product and continue to, slowly, build upon what they have. However, the very notable lacking player retention naturally repels others from playing, creating a vicious cycle of decline. A cycle which I genuinely believe is undeserved for this title. If you've been intrigued or attracted by my introduction of this game and feel it is something you may enjoy, then I strongly recommend you give it a try. It's being sold at an incredibly cheap price for what's on offer in return, and your custom and time at the very least can serve as more encouragement for the developers to not lose hope and encourage other prospective players to give it a try also, even if you ultimately do decide to wait until things are more developed after a while of playing. The issues I've mentioned can certainly be frustrating, but hopefully after taking some time within the world yourself, and some patience, you will come to understand just why I believe this game holds so much potential. Thank you for watching.